Welcome back everyone. Today's uh, video is going to be introducing a totally new concept, something unlike what we've done so far, which is a lower bound on the problem of sorting. So let me just introduce what we're trying to do here. We've seen a few algorithms for sorting so far. We've seen selection sort, insertion sort. Those are both um, n squared, quadratic in the worst case. And then merge sort and heap sort both have this n log n behavior in the worst case. So they're better. Uh, in terms of their worst case performance. And now the question, this isn't exactly a million dollar question, but it's a question that we want to ask is, is anything better than n log n possible? So should we keep looking for better sorting algorithms? Or at some point, uh, because if you if you were to learn about other sorting algorithms, you could learn about quick sort or a few other ones, and you would see that the best ones are consistently n log n time. Um, and so you might ask, is this really the limit of it? Or do we need to keep searching and keep working to try to get a better sorting algorithm? And so that has to do with a, a lower bound for the problem. Um, so what we're trying to really ask is, is there any uh, impossibility result, right? Would it be impossible to get better than n log n time? And impossibility results, I think, in any kind of field are always really difficult because it's to say that something is possible, it's kind of uh, all you have to do is demonstrate like, how do you know that it's possible? Here, I did it. But to demonstrate that something is impossible, you have to really have some kind of a framework for what it means to be possible or not. So what's gonna be really important is that we need a model um, of computation which we might think of as kind of like rules of the game. So if you think about it, inherently, uh, if we say like any sorting pro algorithm, well, maybe you imagine some computer where like sorting is a constant operation or um, the, the computer stores everything in a special way and you have some special instruction that just like sorts thing and or you know, other weird things like that, or, or you're restricted in the kinds of things that you're being asked to sort. Um, so we have to say, well, what do we really mean concretely by the sorting problem? What, what things is an algorithm allowed to do? And that by setting those boundaries, that allows us to get this kind of impossibility result to say that what's a lower bound on the best thing that's possible. Uh, and that model that we're going to use is called the comparison model. And this is the most general model that we know about for sorting. There's other ways that we can uh, think about sorting problems or models that are not the comparison model. And the difference is that the comparison model can sort anything because all that you are assuming is that we can move things around and we can compare items um, like less than or greater than. For other kinds of models, maybe you assume that you can do even more than that. So other things that you might be allowed to do in other models is things like arithmetic. For example, if you knew that you were sorting things that were generally in a certain range and they were all numbers, you might be able to look at the value of that number and kind of guess where it's going to go in the sorted list. And then maybe you can sort faster because of that. For And as an extreme case, if I know that what I'm sorting is the numbers like from 1 up to n, well, then sorting is super easy because I can just take each number and put it where it goes. When I see the number five, I know that it goes in index five in my array. Or maybe index four if you're counting from zero. Um, so what we have to say in our model is like, that's not allowed. So what we say is that the only things you can do with the array is move them around elements one at a time and compare them uh, two at a time. And once you restrict things like that, now we are able to potentially say something about what's possible or what's not possible in terms of sorting. So before we get into that, um, I want to think about a slightly different example of a game. And we looked at this actually in class today as, as your puzzle problem from today. Okay, so here's uh, the kind of game that we looked at in class today. So it's a game called Guess Who. And if you weren't in class today, or if you're not familiar with this game, you might want to Google it real quick, but the idea is that you, at the beginning, you pick one of these characters as your secret character, and the other person has to ask you yes or no questions in order to narrow down who that person is. And what we 
wanted to, what we want to ask so now what we're thinking about with guess who and how does this connect to algorithms is that you can think of the sequence of questions and uh, approach is kind of like an algorithm so the sequence of questions is kind of like an algorithm to solve the guess who problem where uh, a fully described algorithm would start always with the same question and then depending on the answer to that question you might ask a different question and then you might ask a different question based on that and would always uh if it's a fully described algorithm it would it would have for every possibility what are the questions that you need to ask to always end up with knowing a correct answer so for example one bad algorithm would be just asking one at a time is your person jordan this is a french uh, version of guess who by the way uh, is your version Leo is it is your person Chloe one at a time that would be kind of a big O of N algorithm to solve guess who wouldn't be particularly efficient but I think it would always work and we thought about a little bit about what would be a better or worse algorithm and we said a desirable property of algorithm um, a good algorithm for the worst case would try to uh, ask questions that would divide into. But what I want to emphasize is that we might, we don't actually, in order to understand the limits, the lower bound on this problem, we don't actually have to be analyzing a single algorithm. What our goal is to analyze any possible algorithm. So while a good algorithm might, we might have this idea that a good algorithm should try to split the possibilities in two. Our argument that we're going to make for a lower bound here doesn't depend on that. And in particular, like for this set of faces, I'm trying to think of, you know, what would be the good first question that would split this in two? Maybe if you ask, is it a boy or a girl? Maybe that's close to half, but maybe not quite. Maybe if you ask, do they have glasses? Um, that might not be quite half and half. So what we have to imagine is just any algorithm. So for this lower bound, we say that we imagine any algorithm for this problem. And I realize that you can't see what I wrote up here because of my face, but this says sequence of questions is an algorithm. I think that should let you see it. You can take away my face. Um, yeah, so we imagine any algorithm for this problem, and we want to say how could we force it to ask the most number of questions? Or equivalently, how could we figure out what the worst case is for that algorithm. So you have to imagine that the world champion guess who player comes in and has their strategy of which questions to ask. And your goal is to figure out what's the worst case face for that algorithm. Um, so how could you figure out the worst case, or at least a bad case? And one way to do that is you could adapt to the questions that are asked. So let's let's say someone comes in with the supposed best algorithm and they say the first question is going to be um, do do they have uh, glasses? So now we want to count. There's 25 uh, faces here total. So we want to count. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight. 9, 10, looks like 10, 11, I forgot about Cecile, uh, 11 with glasses. So that means that there's 11 with glasses and there's 14 without glasses. And in order to figure out the worst case, you always want to answer in a way that would leave the most number of possibilities. So in this case, we would say no, in order to leave the most number of possibilities. Okay, now the algorithm will be only considering the people that don't have glasses, and they might ask uh, another question like, does a person have earrings? So out of those that are left, we want to count how many have earrings. And I guess pigtails don't count as earrings. Um, and notice I'm not counting like Emily because she's already out since she has glasses, but like Valerie has earrings here. I think, yeah, Aurora has earrings. Um, Esme does not. Louis and Patrice uh, don't, but Aurelie does. And okay. Ah, yeah, here we go, some earrings. So it looks like we have, out of the 14 remaining, we have four that have earrings. So then we would answer to this earrings question, we would also answer no. And so that eliminates 
those four people only, but still leaves uh, should still leave 10. Right, so every time we're answering in such a way that leaves the most number of possibilities. We might answer yes sometimes. Um, it, the answer is just based on what's going to leave the most number of remaining possibilities. And so now the question is, how long could you keep this process going? Well, to answer that, to think about that, what we have to think about is, um, so if we ask zero questions, then there's 25 possibilities here. Again, in the example I think that I grew up with and what you did in class, there was 24 faces, but here there's 25, so that's what we have from zero questions. If we ask one question, then there's an answer to that question where that leaves at least 13 faces left. Why is that? Because no matter how evenly that question splits, you know the most even it could split is 12 and 13. So there's going to be some answer to that first question. Even if it's the perfect first question from the best possible algorithm, there's going to be some question that leaves 13 possibilities. Okay, and then we can continue this process after two questions, there must be some face that after two questions leaves how many faces remaining? Uh, how many possibilities? Well, at least, it looks like at least seven. Because from the 13 that we had after one question, the most even split would be like um, six plus seven. So there's something that leaves seven. And then we can keep going with this. So it's always going to be the ceiling of n over 2 from the previous step. So this would be 4 after 3 questions. After 4 questions, there might be something that leaves at least 2 possibilities. And that means that uh, after 5 questions, there's something that leaves at least 1. And the important thing is that if we only ask 4 questions, then there has to be some uh, face, actually 2 of them, that would both be possible after those 4 questions. And so what that tells us is that no matter what the algorithm, for any algorithm, for any set of questions, we need strictly uh, more than four questions. Four questions is not enough. Because there's some two faces that after those four questions, they would be the same. And so all this required for this is that there's some series of questions and that the series of questions is consistent. Always starts with the same one and given the same answers, it always asks the same question next. Kind of how an algorithm would work where for a sorting algorithm or a search algorithm or something else, you don't know what it's going to do, but it'll always start the same way and always have the same sequence of if statements um, in order for it to be the same code. So now let's, so we just proved that any algorithm for the guess who problem with 25 faces needs at least five questions in the worst case. That's not to say that five questions is possible. Again, like maybe there's not that perfect set of five questions, but at least five questions would be necessary. So let's break that down of how we came up with that. It's really about powers of two. So what we're looking for is the least k such that the number of possible answers over 2 to the k is less than or equal to 1. Because as long as this is more than 1, that means that there's going to be some input which leads to more than one possible answer. Okay, so in, in the specific example there, the number of answers was 25. There was 25 faces. And also I'll point out that why is it 2 is because we're restricted to yes or no questions. And now we can think about other examples. So what if we had a um, like a size 30, guess who? Then what would it be is actually it would end up being the same because uh, 30 over 2 to the 5 is less than 1, but 30 over 2 to the 4 is bigger than 1. Um, so that's right. But the first size that we would need more than 5 questions would be like size 33, I guess. So like if we had size 33, then we would need at least 6 questions in the worst case. And so this just goes to demonstrate that um, for any size problem, we can come up with this number. And in fact, if you do this math, it's going to be the ceiling of log base 2 of n. 
So in general, for n faces, we have the ceiling of log base 2 of n. And I want to again emphasize why is it log base 2 is because there's two possible um, answers to each question that can be answered. you know it's yes or no question and there's n possible outputs from the algorithm so the algorithm has to do n different things you could think of it as like different actions different actions needed Right, the algorithm has to be able to identify each of those faces uniquely, and this is the number of uh, answers to each question that the algorithm uh, is allowed to ask. So now let's, maybe you're seeing where this is going, but now let's start to try to think about, not in terms of games like Guess Who, let's, turn, let's try to think about actual uh, problems that we care about for this class with computer algorithms. So let's think about the uh, search problem that we kind of started the whole class with, which is given a length and array and a value x, find the index of x or not found. So now if we want to apply this kind of a lower bound argument, we have to think about what are the questions that can be asked about the input? And in particular, how many answers can there be to each question? And then we also want to think about how many different number of outputs or actions are necessary um, from any algorithm. And again, I want to emphasize, we're not thinking about any particular algorithm. We're thinking about the problem. Okay, so what are the questions that can be asked here? Well, it's going to be comparisons. You're allowed to compare x to anything in the array. And so that means that the outputs can be less than or greater than. So there's two outputs, two possible answers to each question. And then the actions that would need to be taken, well, there's actually n plus 1 because we have n indices in the array or not found. So those are kind of n plus one possible different outputs, different things that the algorithm would have to, any algorithm for the search problem would have to be able to say. And so from that, we can conclude that the lower bound is that any algorithm must do at least ceiling of log base two. Again, it's two because there's two um, outputs from each comparison of n plus one. So we can say that any search algorithm would have to do at least this many comparisons, and therefore at least that many steps, um, no matter what, by any search algorithm. And one really interesting thing here is that, notice we didn't assume that the array was sorted. We just said if it's any array, no matter how it's organized. And so this is kind of cool because you know that binary search matches this bound, right? So this is a big omega of log n for any algorithm. And binary search has a big theta of n log n, of, sorry, big theta of log n cost. Big theta of log n cost for binary search. So since it's matching, that means that binary search is optimal, not just for searching over a sorted array, but actually sorted over any array. So in other words, this is an amazing thing that there's no better way to organize an array than, than sorting it. Maybe that's obvious, but I think it's kind of exciting. So um, binary search is optimal for any kind of search. Um, you can never do better, you can never get faster than what binary search gives you, no matter how you organize it. So you can't imagine like, oh, but what if I kind of sorted halfway and then organized it in this other thing and put like the even numbers first or something? Nope. Nothing you could possibly do to organize the elements of an array would allow you to search faster than binary search, as long as you're only allowed to do comparisons. So that's a powerful statement. Um, and to get to that powerful statement, we had to do kind of some uh, 
mental arithmetic and math of thinking about what does this really mean about the lower bound. So it's a tough thing. This is um, what makes this tough is, and I want to kind of emphasize this, there's multiple levels of how this class works. So at the bottom level, we can think about implementations. And that means like a specific program um, to do some problem. You know, so it could be Dan's uh, C++ program, or it could be like uh, Emily's Java program. I'm writing in horrible handwriting right now, but uh, I think you get the idea or anything else. And we know how to compare those or how would you say that one of those is bad is you would come up with some input, you would run that program and you would say, look, it's bad. It takes a long time. But what we're trying to do is always move up to kind of the higher level to save ourselves effort of having to fully realize things. So if we think in terms of algorithms, what would it mean to say that an algorithm is bad or an algorithm is slow? Well, in order to say that, we would, we would say that um, a big theta or a big omega, any kind of lower bound on the worst case runtime is large. Right, so for example, to say that selection sort is slow, we can say that because the selection sort is big theta of n squared, and we know that n squared quadratic time is kind of slow. So in, in order to say that an algorithm is slow, it's not a matter of running it on some particular input, but now we're kind of moving up to the next level and we do some analysis of the algorithm, we understand the asymptotic behavior. So now let's think about moving up another level. What would it mean to say that a problem, and in this case, we don't say the problem is slow, but we would say that the problem is hard. What would it mean to say that a problem is hard to solve? That means that every algorithm is slow. Right, so just like if we say an algorithm is slow, that's the same thing as saying that every implementation is slow, right? If, if uh, selection sort is a slow algorithm that takes n squared time, then no matter what tricks you use to implement it, it's still gonna be an n squared algorithm, it's still gonna be slower than merge sort eventually. So now if we wanna say a problem is hard, what that's saying is that every algorithm is slow. So what's powerful about this, but also difficult to reason with, and so th if this is a little bit tough to grasp, you're, you're in good company. It's, it's tough for everybody when they learn about this to grasp it, so just take your time and be patient with yourself. That's why I'm trying to take my time also to, to give a bunch of ways of thinking about it. Um, so what does it mean for a problem to be hard is that we've proven that every algorithm, no matter what genius might have come up with this algorithm, no matter what brilliant researcher somewhere else in the future uh, does something, it's always going to be at least this slow. And how can we argue about that? Well, that's um, these lower bounds on a problem. So this is kind of the goal of what we're doing right now. So it's really about impossibility results, saying that it's impossible to have an algorithm which is faster than whatever. So we just proved, for example, that for searching problems, searching through an array by only doing comparisons, Log n is a lower bound on any possible algorithm to solve the search problem on an array. Even if it's sorted or unsorted or sorted in some special way or organized in, it doesn't matter. Um, even if we're organizing in some kind of fancy tree, if you're only allowed to do comparisons, then at least log n time is always necessary uh, for searching. And now let's put in the one ingredient that we need to also get a lower bound on sorting. So the one additional ingredient we need for sorting is to answer how many possible outputs. Right? So we know that it's going to be, we know that our lower bound is going to be something like ceiling of log base two of something. 
because we're doing comparison based sorting. So that's where the two comes from. You can do less and greater comparisons. And this is the general form of this, what's called an information theoretic lower bound that we've been seeing many examples of. But the question is what goes in this box? Um, how many different possible outputs are there from sorting? So let's think about one example. Um, imagine your input array has four things in it, like A, B, C, D. And to be clear, when I say A, B, C, D, I'm meaning any possible things, not these letters. Anything. So what is a sorting algorithm doing? It's putting them in hopefully the correct order and then dumping out a new array. But it's not able to give any possible array. It has to have these same things in it. So we can actually write down what are all of the possible outputs here. Um, and so I'm going to probably accelerate the video when I play this to show all the possible outputs that could come out of this. And now at this point, I see that I must have missed a couple. Yes, so I miss everything that starts with AD. And I think I missed a couple of Bs. Yeah, I missed the BDs also. So, but now I got them. So hopefully you can confirm that I didn't duplicate anything and I didn't miss anything. So these are all the different, if your input was A, B, C, D, where A, B, C, D could be any numbers, any values, then these are all the different orderings of those things. And you'll notice if you count these up, there's 24 of them, just like in our initial, um, whoops, just like in our initial a sorting problem, or sorry, initial guess who problem that we saw in class, there are 24. So size four gives 24 of these. So this is called actually the number of permutations and uh, it's n factorial is the general answer. And you can see kind of how that works here. There's uh, four possibilities for the first letter then once you pick whatever is going in the first position, there's three possibilities left for the next one. And once you've picked the first two, then there's two possibilities next for the next one. So you get like four times three times two times one. So 24 is four times three times two times one. And in general, it's n factorial. Um, that's the number of orderings of n elements. Okay, so this is just saying that any comparison-based sorting, another way to think about this is that no matter what those numbers are, if the relative like ordering of them is the same, then all the comparisons come out the same and the sorting itself should be the same. You know, whether you had one, two, four, three, or 34, 35, 37, 36, those are the same relative order. The comparisons would be the same. So the swaps and everything should be the same for any sorting algorithm between those two. And so that's really uh, what we care about. And now we can just put these ingredients together to come up with the lower bound. Um, so now what we need is a lower bound on log base two of n factorial because the piece that was missing before, so we said we went log base two of something and now we just figured out that that something is n factorial. So now the question is just how big is the log base two of n factorial? Um, and so you can think about that for a second. We've actually seen some tools in this class to answer that question. Notice that we need a lower bound on it because the whole point of this is to get a lower bound on the whole problem. So hopefully you've maybe taken a moment to think about this for yourself. I will show you how I like to think about this. So we have this product now. So it's kind of like a summation, but it's everything's being multiplied, um, where it starts at n and it goes down to get down to one. And if we want a lower bound, think about how we've done lower bounds on summations so far, you can pick out the largest thing. So this is certainly bigger than or equal to n. But that doesn't seem to be good enough, you know, log of n 
is not a good lower bound on the cost of sorting. So that's not good enough. If you remember, a good trick for lower bounds is to take the larger half. And so we want to think that how many things are there? We have n over 2 numbers. And how big is the smallest of that larger half? So each of these is at least n over 2. And so we get a lower bound that n factorial is always greater than or equal to n over 2 to the power n over 2. So it's getting exciting now start to get stoked how can we bring this together is the fact that then because we care about the log base 2 of this so the log base 2 of n factorial is greater than or equal to the log base 2 of n over 2 to the power n over 2 which is equal to if you remember the properties of logs this is n over 2 times log base 2 of n over 2 which is n over 2 So I'll write this as 1 half n log n minus, so this is really log of n minus 1. So this is minus um, n over 2. And that means that this term dominates, and we get big omega of n log n. So let's just bring this together again. What we have is for sorting, we're doing comparisons. So there's two outputs from every two possible answers to every comparison, just like yes, no questions and guess who. But unlike with guess who, we're not starting with this, um, you know, n elements, we're starting with n factorial possibilities of how the the elements need to be reordered. So this is the number of possible actions from any sorting algorithm. And now we use some math to figure out that, so this is like the right answer of the lower bound, but then we just needed some math to understand what this means in the context of um, simpler terms than log of n factorial. And we use some math to figure out that this is always at least n log n. And so that shows that every sorting algorithm, not just the ones that we've seen, so this isn't anything about merge sort or heap sort in particular, this is saying that no matter what sorting algorithm anyone will ever come up with, if all it does is comparisons, it's always going to require at least n log n steps. And that is pretty exciting because it means that we don't have to keep searching for faster in terms of uh, big O running time sorting algorithms. And we can rather think about among the n log n sorting algorithms, what's the best one that will work for my particular scenario today. It means that we've solved the sorting problem in the worst case. Very exciting times. Okay, thanks for watching this video. And uh, I know it's a lot to take in. Don't worry, we'll have a lot of time to chat about it during class, and I will see you then.